Hey guys, Ryan Earnhardt here from creativesoundlab.tv. Well, today I'm showing you a bit of kind of an issue that I ran into in a recording session. I had a drummer that sang, a bass player in the room, same room as the drums, and they wanted to sing as well. And the band was really adamant on having live vocals. And, I mean, after hearing the songs, I kind of don't blame them. I mean, they are really critical to the song. But the issue was, is how in the world do I capture these vocals and have something usable? That's the trick, because you know, we have a soft vocalist that is also playing drums. I mean, this is kind of a nightmare for, uh, for mixing. So, I think this has worked out the best that I've ever gotten it to work out, <laughs> okay? Uh, I've been trying to solve this issue for years now, and I think I finally, I just finally found a solution. So, this is cool. Can't wait to show you. Stick around. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I, you know, I was, I was really concerned about this one because I really didn't know how to solve this at first. I thought maybe... Maybe something like the M201 from Bear Dynamic might might work, you know? It is a, you know, I want to say a small diaphragm dynamic mic. It looks like a pencil condenser, but it's not. It's actually a, dyn a dynamic mic, and it's kind of very narrow. And because it's narrow, just the, you know, the physical features of the mic, I believe that makes it, a lot more pleasant when sound comes in from the side, from around the back, etc. So, you know, that was my thought. But then I also thought, well, what about a small diaphragm condenser, you know? So I kind of ran through kind of my head as far as like what might work. And I ended up with the uh, the Soyuz 13. Now, I, I think about any small diaphragm could work. Uh, but this was just kind of something that I kind of had set up, ready to go. I just had to figure out how to control the pops into these mics. Small diaphragms really don't have a lot of pop protection. And so I ended up just taking a piece of foam and just taping it on the small diaphragm mic and hanging it over the drummer. Then over here, I just use a pop filter because, uh, you know, space was less of, of an issue. I don't want to be intrusive over here, um, you know, with a drummer. Over here, I kind of came up over the top. And, yeah, it's a small diaphragm. Now, these 13s, you know, technically speaking, they're only a millimeter smaller than a full 14. So are there really small diaphragms? I don't know. Probably not. But I think that this technique would work even better with a true small diaphragm, you know, because the smaller that capsule is, at least this is my little theory, is that I think that it's more and more pleasant of bleed out to the sides. And these 13s, they're decently small, and so that's why I think they work. They're kind of a balance between a vocal mic, which is a little bit larger of a capsule, and a small diaphragm, which is a small capsule. So this was kind of a good compromise. The only issue was is protecting the mic against pops. So taped on the foam, put up a pop filter, and the idea was to allow this to blend with my dark overhead mic. Now, not dark in color, but dark in tone. This is a stereo ribbon mic here. And I knew that it'd be fairly dark. And I knew that this hi-hat probably could have used a mic on it. But instead, being that I have two of these mics, and if during mixing I could have the choice of hard panning, then I actually could take this mic with the hi-hat bleed and use that bleed as a sort of hi-hat mic and pan it off to where the hi-hat mic would go. So this mic here has become 
a hi-hat mic. So this is kind of my thought process all in a split second. You know, the, the band was like, we got to have these vocals. And I was just thinking, okay, uh, let's just embrace the bleed. How do we do that? We have two of them. So the vocalist could kind of be panned, probably, because the other vocalist will be off to the other side. When it's panned, it could be the hi-hat mic, right? That's what we have. Okay, that was kind of my process. Embrace the bleed. Don't try to cover it up if you can't get rid of it. Work with it, okay? So, let me just kind of show you kind of the raw sound of this bleed. I, I think it's pretty cool. So that right there, with this mic, it's kind of creating a, a, a faux room mic. I mean, it is a room mic, right? I mean, it's a room mic that happens to be in front of a vocalist. That's the way we have to think, okay? Just like the hi-hat mic happens to be next to a vocalist as well. And it's kind of like a... You know, you could almost you could almost think of it as an overhead mic. Like, an overhead mic that happens to be next to a guy singing, right? Think of think of the position. This is another idea that I was thinking of is maybe I should go with something like a 414. Um and and you know maybe have it, you know, kind of that classic, you know, over the drummer's head kind of position. Uh, kind of a central location. Now, what if we took that and we just lowered it a bit, right? So, instead of over the drummer's head, it's kind of back and over the drummer's head, we just lower it a touch it's still centralized to the drummer. And then, you know, we get an overhead that happens to pick up a vocalist, you know? That'd be a great way to actually work this in. If you had like a, a dual-sided mic, like a two-channel mic like the LCT 640 TS by Lewitt, that'd be a good choice for this. Um, and I, I tried that, but not quite with that technique. A couple years ago, well, a little over a year ago, you know, this has been an issue for a while, okay? A little over a year ago, I tried the 640, and I tried to kind of shape the polar pattern, the null, to reject the drum kit, and it worked pretty good. I think I would have done better to face one side just directly at the kit and the other side directly at the vocal and just embrace the bleed, um, and then, you know, you can turn up the vocal, turn down the kit kind of thing. Because then at least you have a central mic for the drum kit. So that was kind of a, a backup idea for this, is, you know, an overhead mic that happens to pick up the vocalist. Here we have, you know, a vocal mic that is going to pick up hi-hat, and I'm going to just embrace that. And going back to our first example, a room mic that happens to pick up the vocalist. Which way On your sad. Yeah, and you know, I even tuned these vocals. You know, I just, you know, I didn't do a ton of work. I just kind of, you know, highlighted everything, just kind of cranked it up a bit. And in the mix, it, it pretty much worked. So I kind of went with it. Okay, that's, you can hear some editing as well. And I actually grouped these tracks in with the drum tracks. So it is treated exactly like a pair of room mics here. Okay, when I sliced and lined up, you know, the timing of the drums, just to kind of lock them in a, a bit better, I was also moving these vocals around. Now you can hear he's kind of ahead, just a touch. Can't do much about it. Okay, that's... That's going to be kind of the, the human element where, you know, there's still some looseness in the music. And I'm going to embrace that as well. But I tighten up the drums, so, you know, it's kind of a give and take there. So that's the, the raw sound of, you could say, the room mic or 
the background vocalist left. Let's check out the background vocalist right, Kevin on the drums. Oh, I see what's happening here. We are panning. Okay. So, a lot of hi-hat bleed there, right? But that's okay. You know, I'm going to embrace that. See, it's my hi hat mic, you know? Like that hi hat in the right channel, that's coming from that vocal mic. Everything else is kind of darker on the darker side of things. That was kind of the, the plan of attack. Uh, then from here, I went ahead, I reached for the split EQ. My gosh, this thing really, really is nice. Um, let's see how it does with this drummer's uh, vocal mic here. Yeah, I mean, we can literally turn up and down the sound of the hi-hat. Pretty incredible. Let me uh, move the video frame out here. And it looks like I, I turned up the tonal element right at his fundamental. And then I turn down other stuff like bleed, other stuff like that. You know, I, I guess we could actually just invert the scale. This is amazing. Um, there's some really well thought out features in this plugin. So yeah, that's just giving me a little bit of an edge, you know? I'm not trying to completely get rid of the bleed. I know it's going to be there, but it's just giving me a little bit of an edge. Uh, you know, another thing we could do is we could go for a very fast attack, uh, a little bit of a, uh, of a release, kind of a de esser setting. We can kind of compress, kind of get in and get out before anybody knows that we're there. And... By doing so, we're kind of only compressing the hi-hat, but the longer sustained vocal will, I mean, it might sound a little choppy and, and solo, but in the mix, it, it might just sound like there's less hi-hat. In the mix. If you're down to your last smoke, and your pockets are spent, and all that you want is a nice warm bed, because you're cold and you're tired, the wounds never met. Which way is the right way? Whenever it's a dead. It's not exactly gain matched before and after, but here's here's again with. 
So, I mean, that definitely helps as well, you know? It's a little aggressive for my taste, but that's not bad. And I've seen it done as well where, uh, when, not that I've seen it done, I, I have experimented with, you know, doing a fast compressor because you can kind of, you know, separate stuff out based on the speed, okay? And that worked pretty good. But, I mean, honestly, uh, you know, choosing the right tool for this and kind of creatively thinking, okay, these vocal mics aren't really a vocal mic. They're more like a, a room mic, or they're more like kind of a hi-hat slash overhead mic. Think of them like that. Now we could actually start to mix them in with the drums, make them a part of something. So I think that uh, for this mix, uh, you know, again, it's not like a final mix or anything, but um, I added some... So EQ, I, I took out some of the high end. I boosted some of the the 5K area, a little compression. You know, I just kind of took it and, you know, made the things that I knew I wanted more, things that I wanted less of, a little bit less. Uh, and then I could use just less of it in the mix. So if I wanted more kind of body of the vocal, more of the notes, then I could say boost two or 300, right? And then you could use less of it, therefore getting less noise, less noisy bleed, right? Um, if I needed more hi-hat, I could take out some of the body of the vocalist, therefore I need more of that mic, right? To get the same amount of background vocal in the mix. And then it gets me back my hi-hat. So, you know, you can use EQ to kind of make it more effective the amount that you're using in the mix to kind of get the balance right. Wow, that's crazy. Okay, let me take that off. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, this this works great. And you also uh, could experiment with, like, um, uh, probably not this one because the, the drummer is the vocalist, but if there were two people in the room that, you know, it's kind of a diffused sound, you could experiment to see if you could add, like, 20 millisecond delay to the vocal mics then what you get is actually a really nice drum room sound. Now, it's going to technically, you know, mess with the timing a little bit of the performers, right? Like, you could say, well, that's not how they sing the song, you know? they Maybe they sit ahead of the beat or behind the beat or whatever, and like, yeah, okay, you're messing with people's time. Maybe you're adding 30 mil, 40 milliseconds, but, I mean, 20 milliseconds, let's take that. That's 20 feet. I mean, people stand 20 feet from each other all the time and play music together. So, I, I don't know. I, I don't think it's that big of a deal to 20 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds. You can actually get more of that room sound. Like in this case here, uh, you know, I could I could actually add 20 milliseconds to, uh, let's say, the, the bassist mic here. And kind of get more uh, more of the effect. And it creates just a really cool um, kind of texture. You've been calling the doctors. Cause the pain never ends. Yeah, you lost in your boat. Searching around. Saying which way is the... In fact, you know, I could just take split EQ off. I could just do it raw. See how that sounds. If you're wanting some answers and you're needing a friend, you've been calling the doctors. Cause the pain never ends. Yeah, you lost. 
Yeah, I mean, that actually works, right? That's that concept of a room mic that happens to be, you know, happens to have somebody standing in front of it and singing, you know? Uh, then, you know, from there we could we could take it, we could, uh, you know, we could darken it up a bit um, just to kind of make it so that it's not so, not so crazy. And you're needing a friend Ooh, You've been calling the doctors Ooh, Cause the pain never ends Ooh, Yeah, you're lost and you're broke Ooh, Searching around Yeah, so, you know, that's another way of, of kind of making it work um, as its own thing. Um, I wouldn't do that with the with the drummer mic because, I mean, it's kind of a part of the sound. I don't, you know, this is a hi-hat mic, that that kind of concept of a hi-hat mic really works for this. But, I mean, I've been trying to experiment with this issue for a while. I've even looked up the um, the OM7 by Audix. Uh, maybe maybe that that is maybe a couple of those uh, a couple of those mics I could experiment with. Um, the Lawton uh, has a couple of mics that would, would be really good for this situation. But the small diaphragms work surprisingly well if you need really pleasing off-axis bleed that you need to make work in a mix. It needs to be a part of the sound. So yeah, i uh, been a couple of years trying to experiment with this, uh, this issue. Um, hope it helps. Let me know uh, what you thought of this in the comments below. Talk to you soon.